Hello and welcome to chapter five. Can you believe after this chapter we'll be a third of the way through our course? Time flies when we're having a good time. I so enjoyed having my grandsons with me the last two weeks. Um, they're not with me today even though we're still studying their stage of development. Um, so I'm gonna have to do this solo. I can tell you that through the raising of our children, I enjoyed every stage. It seemed like the stage they were at was my favorite. And now that they're young adults, that's my favorite as well. And now that I have grandsons, I am really enjoying their stages of development. And those preschool years that we're going to be talking about today have got to be some of my favorite because they are so much fun. Their worlds are so big and they are learning so quickly. And as we look at the social world of infants and preschoolers, those people who they're closest to are their parents, um, grandparents, we hope, um, caregivers, and their playmates. So this week we're going to learn about attachment. Erickson was a forerunner on the information that we learned through this because his first three stages of psychosocial development tell us much about the development of children. Trust versus mistrust, um, autonomy versus shame and doubt, and then initiative versus guilt. I believe that you cannot spoil a baby. They need lots of attention. Um, children spell love, T-I-M-E. So it's not only the amount of time we spend with our children, but the quality. So we often ask ourselves, what if a parent is employed outside the home and cannot be the full-time caregiver of the child, can they still be attached? I strongly believe yes. And the quality of time that the parent spends with the, time, with the child can make a huge impact on that child's attachment. Social development is critical for a newborn, for a toddler, as it sets the foundation for a lifetime of relationships. And you want those relationships throughout your child's life to continue to be positive. That leads us to attachment. Um, to define that, that's the emotional bond that develops between a child and a particular person. Theorists who come to mind when it comes to attachment, uh, one of the forerunners was Conrad Lorenz. He believed that it was a concept called imprinting, that the baby will um, be attached to the first thing it sees after it is born. So he did a study with baby goslings, and sure enough, when they were hatched, they would follow their mother. Well, one time he didn't have the mother, so he hatched the babies with an incubator, and the the babies, when they were hatched, they imprinted to him. They followed him around as if he were their mother because he was the first thing that they saw when they were hatched. Freud suggested that all attachment uh, was determined from the mother's ability to satisfy her baby's oral needs. I think we would argue that it doesn't always have to be the mother as other people in the child's life can satisfy their baby's oral needs. Many fathers can be just as attached to the child or the child attached to the father as they are to the mother. John Bowlby said that attachment is based on an infant's needs to, um, for safety and security. Typically, this is the mother, he said, but again, we would argue the primary caregiver. And we know that the, the person who is the primary caregiver, that bond is different between the child and that person than others. Um, Bowlby viewed attachment as home base. Who did the child gravitate to in order to feel secure? And then Mary Ainsworth, she built on Bowlby's theory and she developed her strange situation. And how that worked, she would have the mother and baby enter an unfamiliar room the mother then would sit down, leaving the baby free to explore. And then a stranger, somebody the baby had never seen before, would enter the room and then first converse with the mother and then with the baby. Then the mother left the room, leaving the baby alone with the stranger. The mother then returns, greets the child, comforts the baby if that was necessary, and the stranger leaves. 
The mother departs again, leaving the baby alone. The stranger returns, and then the mother returns, and the stranger leaves. And throughout this whole time, uh, my source for that was another textbook that I'm very familiar with, which is um, Feldman's fourth edition of Discovering the Lifespan. So I um, borrowed that information from that textbook. Um, basically, they wanted to know how the child was going to react with the mother coming and going when there was a stranger present. And so uh, Mary Ainsworth, she found there were four patterns of development, secure, avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized slash disoriented. Um, the child that was secure felt at ease with the stranger present, especially if the mother was present, avoidant. They would avoid the mother. If she left, the child really didn't seem distressed. Ambivalent, there were both positive and negative reactions, usually positive at first and then negative. And then if the mother returns, the child might hit and kick the mother because they were mad that she had left. And then the fourth stage was the disorganized, disoriented. And this one's just very inconsistent. This was a, a stage that they brought in later after Ainsworth did her original research because they found that some children were disorganized, disoriented, um, handled themselves very inconsistent, maybe contradicted themselves, and even were a little confused. They may run to the mother, but then start to cry. Our goal through all of this, as we've learned from this research, is that we want our children to feel secure. So how do we do that? As caregivers, we need to be sensitive to our infant's needs, very responsive at an appropriate level. You don't want to be overly responsive. Um, if you, For an infant especially, when you go to feed them, it needs to be on demand. If they're crying, they, you need to go to them, pick them up, let them know you're there for their needs, figure out are they hungry, do they need their diaper changed, do they just need comforted. Um, but definitely the theory is to feed them on demand. If they're hungry, then um, feed them. So we want a parent who's nurturing, warm, affectionate, and supportive. And this can be the father or the mother or many grandparents. I'm our caregivers. Many of my students have been raised by their grandparents. And so that grandparent can be uh, the one that the child is securely attached to. In this chapter, you're also going to learn about play. Um, parallel play is what it's called about their first birthday. When they play alone, they may be right next to another child, but if they're both one years old, probably both children are doing their own thing. They might be taking each other's toys, but they are basically playing alone. 15 to 18 months, they're engaging um, in simple sociability, so they might be playing together. Um, two years, they will do cooperative play. They've been taught hide-and-seek or other kinds of games like that, that they cooperate with one another. Preschoolers um, play a lot of make-believe. Uh, they'll mimic their parents. They'll play on the telephone. They want to have tea parties if they've seen those types of things. And some children at all ages will do what we call solitary play. Some do prefer to just play alone, and that's okay. How many of us like our alone time? So it's great. In fact, if you're a parent and you have a child who can entertain themselves, that's a bonus. You're also going to learn about the gender differences in play and then also the differences in gender roles and gender identity in this chapter. So just like our other chapters, you're going to learn a lot. Enjoy.